Uh, so um, I'm going to talk about um, writing word distance in groups. Um, my focus area is outer automorphism group. So you've seen some free groups earlier. Um, one of the ways of working on a free group is working on the automorphism group of the free group. And one of the ways of working on this group is working on the this nice place spaces it acts on. What trying to do is you're trying to write distance between two elements of the group in terms of the geometries of the spaces it acts this group acts on. So um, so let me just start by introducing you my objects. So So this is going to be free group, non-abelian, on um, n letters. Okay. Um, one of my objects is the the auto automorphism group of the free group. So this is the you take the automorphisms and model it out by inner automorphisms. Um, so to talk about something like this, I'm going to give you two more other groups to, as a background information also. Um, also, the, the most of the research done in the automorphism group is, is done by comparing this with other groups, linear groups and um, mapping class group. So the other object that I'm going to have today is the mapping class group. So S is going to be a surface possibly be well punctures. Um, the mapping class group um, is going to be self homeomorphisms, orientation preserving up to isotopy. Okay. All right, again, the goal is writing um, so writing um, distance word distance, or maybe I should say at actually estimating word distance um, in these groups in terms of um, spaces or actually are hyperbolic simplicial complexes. They act on. Okay, so my tools are going to be as follows. So I'm going to have a um, geometric object. Okay, I'm going to have a co combinatorial object, and this is going to be hyperbolic. Um, the third one, I will have a notional projection. Okay, so let me tell you briefly the, the three examples that I'm going to talk about. Um, one of them is the, um, let me tell you this way, the group is SL to Z. Um, the geometric object is going to be let me write this way, maybe. The geometric object is going to be torus or punctured torus. Um, combinatorial object is going to be, it's called Feyer graph. OK, so for the mapping class group, um, I'm going to have something more complicated than torus. This is just a surface with more genus. Um, Fairy graph is going to switch to some more complicated uh, combinatorial object, curve complex, um, hyperbolic, hyperbolic. OK, when we come to the outer automorphism group, things are going to start getting a little shaky. 
Um, so I'm going to have a three manifold here as my object. Let me just briefly tell you what it is here. Um, it's called double handle body. Connect the sum of S to cross S1. Um, and then my object is going to be, there's several curve complex analogs here. They're geometrically different, but they're all hyperbolic. So I'm, I'm going to, so I mean, included in the research is um, sphere complex and free factor complex. OK, so this is Maezer Minsky. It's hyperbolicity is given by them, 99. Um, free factor complex, so these are all hyperbolic again. Um, Bestphenophane. And one is two group of people. One of them, the first one, um, Handel Mosher. OK, so um, this is briefly what's going on. So um, the distance formula that I'm going to talk about is actually um, Mazur-Minsky distance formula. It's, it's uh, famous that way. And the intuition is coming from this. They sort of um, generalized it to write the, the, the word distance between two mapping classes using the geometry of the curve complex. And we're trying to do that for the other fan currently. But um, we have just some partial results so far. It's an ongoing project, ongoing work. Um, so this is the, the goal. But I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to talk mostly about this so that you will So um, all right, so the first example, as I said, um, SL2Z, uh, Taurus, and Fairgraph. OK, so um, again, think about the Taurus maybe with a puncture, if you like. It's uh, the, the picture's not going to change. Um, all right, so here's what's going on. So every curve on the torus is going to give you a rational number. OK? So let me point this way. Um, a curve on torus, well, here, when I say curve, I'm talking about the homotopy classes. And I'm talking about simple, closed, et cetera. And then on the way, you need to make some uh, um, equivalences, adjustments. But this is pretty much what's going on. If you take a curve on the torus, um, then you get a rational number. So this P and Q are actually, you get a pair of points, lattice points, uh, coming from the homology class of the torus. So this P and Q are relatively prime. OK, so um, and also this is the, the, the slope of the, that curve in the given homology class. Um, to be more precise, so And this curve here is the longitude curve, which is the 0, 1 curve. And uh, or you can think or 1, that's going to be identified with the, uh, the number 0. All the other curves, PQ curves, are going to be P times one and then Q times around the other one. OK? So um, moreover, what happens is if you take a, take a couple of curves, pair of curves, PQ and RS, which intersect once, you get a matrix in SL2Z. Okay. So 
So you can just write them as columns and then you get a matrix. Okay? So that's the this the torus is the actually um, this is the mapping class group of the torus, but I'm not gonna get into that. Okay, so um, on the other hand, what else can you do with these numbers is you can do some sort of projection onto this on this circle, and they fit on the circle. Each of these numbers are going to be a number on the circle. So these number, these, these, then the, you can understand, you can think about the curves as numbers on the circle. So, um, so they fit on circle, and then I'm thinking about the circle as the boundary of the uh, hyperbolic plane with the disk model, okay? Um, boundary of the all right, so um, now we have this picture. Now you got this curve here, P over Q, and then R over S. Um, and then I'm just going to connect them with the geodesic in the hop, uh, hop, uh, hyperbolic plane. And then what I can do is the following. Now I can get a third curve using this too. Okay, so P, Q, R, S, P plus R, Q plus S over, or you can just either add them or subtract them. That gives you a third point, okay? So if you take a triple of points like this, those are all points on the, these are all points, and if you connect them with the geodesics, you get an ideal triangle. Okay, so this point here is something like that. All right, so now you just keep doing this for this guy, for these two, and keep doing it everywhere. You will get a tessellation of the hyperbolic plane, okay, by ideal triangles. And um, the graph that you see here, and you don't look at the, you just look at these um, points, the vertices and the edges, that's the failure graph. Okay? So uh, it is hyperbolic, um, obviously. And um, I'd like to say one more thing about this. Um, which is, so the, what is, so this, this guy here, you can actually see that on the torus. So, um, so it's called the twist. So the third edge for in a given triangle like this, a third, so you have, you know, two of the vertices, the third, third one, third vertex is obtained by, um, taking a day twist of one of them along the other one. Okay. So here's what the interest is. So um, let me just draw this picture again. So imagine that I'm taking it, going to take a day interest of the this purple longitude curve along the the green one. So imagine that you're cutting this along the the green. So you got this following picture. Oops, I should have done it green. Okay, so um, you cut this, and now you give it two pi twists to one side and glue it back. So what happens is, the, is this green one is fixed, nothing happens to that, but something happens to this purple one which intersects that. So the, the picture here, well, I can draw this very well, the, um, is the following. So this is fixed. The other one goes around this green one once. If you do it twice once, it comes back. Okay? So in terms of matrices, what's happening is, um, So if you have P 
PQRS, when you do a day interest along this PQ curve, um, so you got, so the interest gives you Okay, so um, so this is what's going on. This, so this, these are related. The, the, the group is now, you can, you can understand the group, try to understand the group using this graph. Um, also, using the objects coming from your geometric object, which is torus. Okay, so now I'm going to, um, now I'm going to try to tell you um, what do I mean by walking on the group? Um, so let me just try to draw a better picture of this fare graph here, if I can. Okay, so, uh, so this is a this is slightly skewed picture because when you do this projection, actually, th it's not quite going to look like this. But this is. Um, much better for our purposes. So this is the point infinity here, and the point zero is, let's say, here. And there are ways of doing this. Um, let me take, so this is zero over one. Um, positive ones, numbers, let's say, there. Negatives are here. So they also say that you can draw this without taking your hand off the, the board, but I'm not that talented. I'll try not to botch it, though. OK. All right. Um, all right, so this just keeps going. It's just a part of it. Um, Okay, so maybe I'm, I'm going to put one more here. All right, so observe that if you have, if you take a, if you take a pair of curves in which intersect once, you got this matrix, and corresponding, what you have in the graph is an edge between those two, okay? So now my calculating distance between two matrices in sl 2 it turns into moving from one edge to another one in this graph, okay? So um, how is this happening for this graph is the following. Let's say you got, I got this edge here. I don't know if you can see my colors, but let's say I got this, this, this one here. And I want to go to something here. Oh, there's so many colors, but OK. So here, here, here's what's going to happen. There are two moves on this graph, which makes you do that. One is called pivoting. OK. Actually, it's. This is the only thing that you have. Pivoting is, is which corresponds to the actually the interesting along one curve. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. So I'm what I'm going to do first is there's this vertex here. I'm going to pivot on that vertex. So this is the first edge. I pivot once. I go to this one. And I pivot again, I go to this one. OK? So I pivot twice here. All right? Now, this was my pivoting vertex. I'm going to switch that pivoting vertex. That's my second move. All right, so I did this. One, two. I was here. Now I'm, s now I'm on this edge. I'm changing my pivoting vertex. If I did this correctly. All right. So um, 
And then I, I'm going to pivot once, which is here. OK, now I'm, I'm on this edge. I switch again. Now I'm here in the bottom. OK. I pivot again once. Now uh, instead of this, this edge, I got this big edge. And I change again. OK, where was I trying to go? I was trying to go here. All right, now um, I have to do this pivot twice. I got this one. And then uh, I think I have to pivot twice again. OK, so you just pivot, which is a Dane twist on that torus. And then you switch the pivoting vertex. You're actually switching the curve that you are taking the Dane twist along. OK, so the, the distance is, distance estimate between this edge and this edge is just the number of these edges plus the number of pivoting. OK? So, um, so what happens is, can we do this um, for objects, geometric objects, which have genus more than one? All right, so let me talk about the mapping class group briefly again. And, um, and then I will tell you a little bit about the autoautomorphism group. OK, so for the mapping class group, so in higher genus, It, my SL2Z is going to switch with the mapping class group. Um, my torus is going to switch with some more complicated surface. And my fairy graph is going to switch with curve, curve graph. OK. Maybe here it's the time to say what a curve complex is. So this is a combinatorial object that I'm one of the objects that I'm interested in. Uh, the vertices are, again, homotopy classes of curves, simple closed curves. Um, edges are given by um, disjointness. Okay. Now you can see why fairy graph is a curve complex for, for the torus. Uh, so these curves are not really disjoint, but they intersect once. That's the minimum intersection of two curves on torus. There, there, there isn't going to be non-trivial uh, curves on a torus which are disjoint to two curves. So um, I, I should say maybe minimal intersection here. OK, so again, that's hyperbolic by Mazur and Minsky's work. and. Um, all right, so, the, so what's going on there is a Dane twist thing, but the pivoting to switch with the, um, what I'm going to describe uh, now is what is called um, subsurface projection, which actually includes this. OK, so um, turns into. So basically, what's going on here is um, you take a, you're taking two curves, and um, the notion is called relative twisting. So this relative twisting of all these some some two curves along some other third curve. So what's happening is you. Um, Again, I'm drawing the simplest pictures. You cut your surface along gamma. OK, so what I'm drawing here is S minus gamma. That gives you another surface. So let's say this is the curve gamma to uh, copies of gamma. There's some other foliage there. 
So you had some curves on S before. Um, now, I'll take some very simple ones. Okay, so alpha and beta are like that. They were alpha and beta. Now let's call this this guy subsurface something like Z. Now you have another. Now you had S. Now you cut S along this curve, and now you have arcs. Now you can continue with the arcs, but I'm what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to take a neighborhood of these guys, and then complete with the neighborhoods of these gammas, and then that. E each of those regular neighbors is going to give me two options. So for each arc, I'm going to get two curves, which are this joint. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm adding these curves, the boundary, this, this gamma, and making them curves. Okay? So I can do that. And, but that's the curve now in the subsurface. All right? So, so let, let's take, um, here's what I did. I took alpha intersection Z and beta intersection Z and then complete them to curves, whatever that means. Okay, and then um, now let's call them alpha prime and beta prime. Those are curves in the Z subsurface. Now we can calculate the distance between them in the curve complex of the subsurface. Okay, um, distance between alpha prime and beta prime in curve complex of Z. Okay, the notation here, just funny C here for the curve complex, by the way. Okay, so what do you have out of this is, um, Mazur-Minsky formula which actually has a lot more than this, but I am just not talking about most of the stuff. This is the simplest way that I can, I can tell you about this formula. Um, I think 2000. All right, so distance in the mapping class group between two mapping classes um, can be approximated by distance so there are going to be a uh, bunch of curves correspond. You can, ask, you can um, uh, approximate f with, a, with curves, a set of curves, basically, on the surface, which is called marking. So, um, and then there's a, there's a corresponding uh, combinatorial uh, complex, which is called marking complex. So this distance is approximately that distance. And then this distance is, now I'm just going to use those, um, they, uh, let's just call them something, um, subsurface coefficients. So now I'm going to look at all of those subsurface coefficients. So I'm taking these sets of curves projecting them to the subsurfaces, all of the possible subsurfaces. And that gives me this distance in subsurfaces, uh, curve complexes of subsurfaces. And I'm adding them up. Um, but I have to take only the um, big enough ones. There's some threshold here. And uh, once you have that threshold, you're going to have, you, you know how close this estimate is. There's some k and c so that this est estimate um, is valid. So here, again, z is subsurface, all of the subsurfaces, including the z itself, as s itself, actually. Um, so, this, so this is the distance formula, actually, that I'm talking about. Here it was the, for the uh, fair graph, this was just the exactly what I told you, the number of those edges and the twistings. Here you have um, 
those three things are, are going to appear here too because they're, they're annuli. Plus, there are more complicated subsurfaces. They also are here. Okay. Okay, so um, I guess I will talk a little bit now about the autofan case, if you guys are okay with everything. All right, so I hope that I at least gave you some intuitive idea of what's going on. Um, All right, so let me tell you a little bit about the RFN case. So the question is the following. Can, can I just take a automorphisms, automorphisms of the free group just like this and then get some formula like this? The answer is no. Well, not yet. Um, so is there a similar distance formula? Uh, no, because this subgroup of subgroups of out of n are more, much more complicated than the mapping class group. There are certain subgroups which do not appear there, so we have no control over them yet. So we don't know, but we have partial something partial, but um, we have partial solution to this problem. Let's say. So this is my ongoing uh, project with my Tesla advisor and uh, another collaborator. Um, okay, so our solution is the following. Um, So I have something nice for mapping class group. Um, so I'm going to tell you what, what, what we are working on, and I'll, I'll tell you what it is. So there's a distance formula only for certain type of automorphisms, which is called geometric autoautomorphisms. So these are the automorphisms coming from mapping class group shortly. Um, okay, let me tell you one of the, the reasons that we actually try to understand the out of n um, using the methods that we understood the mapping class group So there's a homomorphism. So let me just start with taking S to be um, a surface with um, pi one free group. Okay. And then, um, then there's a map, automorphism actually. Uh, sorry, uh, homomorphism. So this is, this is coming from the action of the mapping class group on the pi 1 to okay, so you just uh, there's this automorphism here. let's call this I I of F. Um, so this is one of the reasons that we think that out of n maybe is like mapping class group might have similar properties. So the second result that we are getting here is that that map is actually quasi-isometric embedding. So this, this mapping class group is, is undistorted in out of n. OK, so, um, so the geometric automorphisms, automorphisms are these guys, the images of mapping classes under this map. So these are geometric. So to get some, some sort of distance formula, notion of a distance, we actually 
um, you use something like this, but then um, what happens is there we were adding them, so completing them to curves. We, I'm just going to take them as arcs, and then um, what happens is I thicken them, and then I, I somehow I turn them into spheres. Okay, so let me tell you about that. So the autofen, um, autofen case here, as I said, um, if you, instead of mapping class group, now I have autofen. Instead of surface, I will have double handle body. Okay, um, and then instead of the curve complex, I will have sphere complex mainly. Vertices are spheres. Again, these are isotopic classes of spheres in, in this three manifold. Let's give it some name. And uh, again, the um, edges are given by disjointness. Okay. Let me tell you what the formula is, and then introduce you this guy, and then that's going to be it, because I'm not going to be able to give you any more the details. Okay, so f the formula is. Um, is the following. Okay, so we think the following. The distance in out of n between um, two geometric autoautomorphisms, well, what's going to happen is I'm going to now approximate the mid graphs. I can, I, I'm going to realize them with, on roses. So there's going to be rows corresponding to this. And there's going to be rows corresponding to this. And then those roses are actually also certain sphere systems. So there's a lot of details here that I'm not telling you. But uh, OK, so this distance is. Um, so there's a, there's a similar notion uh, to the subsurface projection is called subfactor projection of Bessvinophane. Let me just write it here. Okay, but the problem is that does not include the um, rank one case, meaning there's no analog for the that the um, Dane twist case. For the Dane twist case, what you're doing actually here is you're projecting onto an annulus, and then due to the interest. So those, are, those coefficients are inside. I mean, those, the, the estimate includes those subsurface sub coefficients in the maser minsky case. Here, you have to work harder. <coughs> so what we did was our contribution is actually not this, but we defined some notion of relative twisting for conjugate classes. And, um, We introduced that, and we calculated those numbers. And again, with some threshold, you need to take only the big ones. Otherwise, you're going to have to deal with infinite sums here. But when you do that, there are going to be numbers here. This is multiplicative error, and this is the additive error. Up to these two, this distance is going to be this. So that's our current work on progress. OK, so oh, um, yeah, <laughs> I think I haven't deleted yet. Yeah. What are the differences in the underlying spaces? Here, you have all the subsurfaces, including annuli. The twists are included. So by annuli, I mean you're actually projecting the curves on annuli. And you calculate the day twists. 
So those are included here. So, but current technology in the out of n case, there's something called subfactor projection, which you cannot project onto rank one three factor. So you have to, you know, do something else, some define something else. Um, so we that's what we did, and we combined those numbers. Okay. All right. So. I got a tiny bit of time. I'd really like to introduce this three manifold. <laughs> okay, don't hate me. All of a sudden, in the <laughs> groups and free groups, and all of a sudden, there's going to be a three manifold. <laughs> it's actually it turned out to be very useful. I have it. I was able to. Um, Find the you know construct. Let's say uh, find a way to understand geomet uh, dangerous automorphism. There's a dangerous automorphism in the out of n case, but it's a very large group of um, automorphisms, which include the dangerous coming from the mapping class group, but it has more stuff in it. So using this manifold, I was able to actually understand those geometrically. So that's why I have a special interest in this manifold. So let me just introduce you that. OK, so maybe start with the analogy. OK, so analogy is the following. So how, how should we understand this? Um, so you take this sphere and take disks on sphere, pairs of disks, OK? And then just. Um, um, just empty insides, okay? And now, what do you have is a circle. You, you used to have a disk, now you have a circle. There's nothing here. There, you created holes now on the sphere. Stretch them, and then identify these circles. So identify them pairwise. That's why we took pairs. So when you do that, each time you do that, you get a handle. So this is one way to understand surfaces. This is, you know, you know this, you're constructing right now um, genus three surface out of a sphere. Okay, it's not a pretty picture, but so this is S2. So and then this would be three connected sum of S1 cross S1. Okay. Now I'm going to do this in one dimension up, and my let's say the board is S3, so it's not really. I'm not going to be able to draw it, but so the word is S3. Now I'm taking pairs of balls. OK, I'm scooping out balls out of S3, let's say. Now I have this sphere boundaries. So I got this with this, with this, and this with this. Now I identify them. Each time I do that, I got a S2 cross S1. Okay. And uh, why is this useful? Um, so this is a. So let me just draw a set of generators, just a regular. I don't know. So let's just pick a point here. Here's one generator. Um, goes there, comes back from here because these are identified. Okay. Another one. And another one. OK, the fundamental group is free group. So that's the important thing for us. So pi 1 is free group. So this is one of the models that you be used to understand the free group. OK? Another way of understanding this is, um, why is it called double handlebar? This is a picture that I, I like using. Oh, the other thing is there, so this is reducible. So there are spheres in this manifold, non-trivial spheres, meaning you cannot just squeeze them into a point. So for example, this is a sphere. But you can draw very complicated things, like something going out of this, coming back from here, and then you know, going something like that. OK, so there are spheres. So you use the spheres. The sphere complex comes from this. You use the homotopy classes of spheres. 
okay, as vertices, and then you use the um, you use to create edges. The other thing is you can see graphs also here. See that? I mean, I can just I could have just done this very nicely here, and then draw this. And don't forget about the spheres, you see roses, etc. Okay, so uh, the uh, the another picture that to under to use to understand this is the following. This is actually what we used in the um, in the in here. Um, so you take a so I'm going to take a surface with one puncture, a one boundary component. So, um, so if I have an arc like that, so what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to take this, first thicken this to, uh, to handle body. So I'm just going to take it cross, crossing it with I. And then when I do that, um, again, the picture is not going to be nice, but. <laughs> All right, so this arc is going to turn into a disk, something like that. Oh, I didn't do it good. Okay, now I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another one like this and then identify two of them. I'll get a double handle body, which is the same thing. But um, what happens to this, this thing is it, you take one disk and another disk and glue them. We've got a sphere. OK, so in that way, you take these arcs and turn them into spheres. And then you can now try to understand this, how, how to switch. You can think about that. OK, well, as I said, there's a lot of things that I'm not, I'm, I cannot say right now. Uh, but I, my time is up. I'm, I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, well, one important thing about this three manifold is the mapping class group of the three manifold. You can still think about the homeomorphisms, self homeomorphisms. And the mapping class group of this three manifold is almost out of n. So it's not mod anymore. I should say mapping class group. So there's a, there's a sequence, short exact sequence like this. Um, There's a kernel here, but the kernel is finite. It's uh, z to the some finite number. So this is the mapping class group is almost out of n. And also, this is surjective. Yeah, I mean, the short exact sequence. Yeah, yeah. There is, yeah. Yep. Z to, I, I'm not writing this, uh, z mod 2 to the k. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Those are dangerous. There's a notion of a dangerous in this manifold too. There's a there's a dangerous. You can do dangerous along a sphere. You can just throw in so, uh, objects here in this manifold and try to do the you know some some sort of dangerous. That's what I did to to generalize the dangerous to get a geometric picture. But uh, this is coming from dangerous along spheres. So if you do it twice, somehow it just just goes off, and there are only you know finite many of them. So, yep. It's big. Big. What? I mean, what? In what sense? The kernel in that case is not. If you compare it with out of n, the kernel is huge. It's not, it doesn't give you this, for example. Uh, You're not going to have this nice kernel there. So, and there's a lot of research being done on that kernel also. It's OK, 
so we'll break for tea and